What accounts for the vast diversity of life on earth? That is a question that everyone ponders at some point in their lives. Christians, such as myself, have a simple answer to that question. God did it. All Christians can agree to this statement, but it's not a particularly satisfying answer for those who want to know something beyond ultimate origins. The follow-up to the statement from non-Christians and most Christians will always be, but how and when did God create the abundance of life on earth? Now, the answers to these questions are not so simple, nor are they the same among all those who call upon God as their Lord and Savior. One possible answer, which I'll critique today, comes from young earth creationists who respond that all living things find their origins as distinct types of life called kinds about 6,000 years ago. This popular model of origins proposes that God independently created various kinds of plants, animals, and so forth. All living things today are descendants of these original created kinds. So what did these created kinds look like? And how many were there? This is where young earth creationists find themselves at odds with each other. To answer the question, one needs to know what the limits and boundaries are of a kind. So how do we know when we're looking at two living things today that they share a common ancestor in the original creation, they are the same kind, or if they are separately created, are different kinds? Ah, that is the question before us today. What is a biblical kind, and why has it been so hard for young earth creationists to identify what they believe are fundamentally different kinds of organisms? I have to say, it's all kind of confusing, but let's explore the landscape of ideas within young earth, or should I say, young life creationism. Young Earth creationists in the 21st century take a broadly inclusive view of the relationship of existing and extinct species as they relate to the kinds of organisms that God created on days 4, 5, and 6 of the creation week. For example, the image to the right is from a new display on the origin of great apes at the Creation Museum and is representative of Answers in Genesis' understanding of the origin and diversification of kinds. The Creation Museum proposes all great apes, ex excluding humans, find their origin in a single proto-ape representative created by God on the sixth day of creation. Since that supernatural dust-shaping event, that ape, through ordinary generation, natural selection, and mutations, has diversified both pre- and post-flood into dozens of living and extinct lineages of organisms that we call species today. For young earth creationists, identifying which types of organisms were part of God's original creation should be kind of important. It should shape how they interpret anatomical, behavioral, and genetic evidence for common ancestry and how they classify the living things in God's creation. For example, if great apes are the same kind and therefore share a common ancestor, then differences in chromosome numbers, ambulatory means, metabolism, social structures, and so forth require some explanation for how they could have been derived from a single common ancestor. However, if God made chimpanzees and gorillas as separate kinds, they cannot share a common ancestor. Differences between them would need no explanation. However, any evidence of common ancestry of chimps and gorillas would need to be explained. In the case of the great apes, the creators of the Creation Museum demonstrate that they accept the evidence for common ancestry of great apes and are striving to provide scientific explanations for these similarities. For humans, though, they emphasize the differences from great apes and dismiss any evidence of common ancestry. Despite such confident depictions of species origins, defining the meaning of the Hebrew word mean, translated in English as kind from scriptures, has proven to be a difficult task for young earth apologists. Identifying kinds is presumed to be the key to identifying what organisms share ancestors in the past and which are created separately during the creation week and thus do not share common ancestry. Today, many young earth creationists ascribe to an interpretation of creation that holds that kinds are not what we recognize as species today, except possibly human beings. Rather, what we identify today as species are simply the end products of processes of diversification of an originally created ancestral kind. This results in the production of many discrete, morphologically and or genetically distinguishable groups of individuals that we call species. 
Now, let's look at how young earth creationists use both broad and narrow arguments in their apologetics. Creationists seek broad common ancestry while also celebrating the uniqueness of species. The move to accept large doses of common ancestry has led to some mixed messaging on the origin of kinds and the specialness of some species. For example, how might the origins pitch look different if the okapi was created separately from the savanna giraffe versus the two sharing a common giraffe kind ancestor created by God on the sixth day? I would submit that the answer is foundational to the apologetic message. Take the giraffe kind. Ken Ham and other creation scientists have spent years telling their audience that the giraffe's long neck is irreducibly complex, that it can't have evolved from a shorter-necked animal. The implication, sometimes directly said, is that God must have made giraffes the way they are. They are a created kind of animal. But then some visitors to the Ark Encounter must find it rather jarring when they encounter a sign explaining the origins of giraffes. And I'll read this for you. Uh, why is the giraffe's neck so short? And again, this is on a display in front of the, uh, the giraffe kind that's on the ark at the ark encounter. Giraffidae is a family of large mammals currently represented by only two species. Those would be two living species. They have split hooves and rechew their food, indicating they qualify as clean animals according to the dietary laws described in Leviticus. This means that up to seven pairs of, of this kind may have boarded the ark rather than just a single pair. Today, giraffids are often considered in light of their most popular member, the long-necked giraffe. However, the other living member of the family, the okapi, has more reserved proportions. Indeed, the majority of fossil giraffids have shorter necks than the modern giraffe, many much shorter. This suggests that the ark giraffes were probably more okapi-like in appearance than the giraffe. The long neck of the giraffe is only one example of variation within this kind. Um, Sevatherium, with its stocky body and branched ossicones, represents a moose, while Bramatherium has a plate of bone on its head that split into four ossicones, like an elaborate headdress. Fossil giraffids have recovered from rock layers as low as the Miocene Asia, uh, across Asia, Africa, and Europe. So yes, there are dozens of fossil species that are known that are considered part of the giraffe family. And here we have answers in Genesis that is identifying all those members of the family as one kind. Though God created this one kind of giraffe that has then diversified into all the giraffes that we see in both the fossil record and alive today, including the short and long-necked giraffe. So it seems there's been a transition over time from young earth popularizers from emphasizing evidence for God's creating directly to God creating through programming, some kind of genetics, or guiding some kind of direct intervention, the development of an organism over time. There are innumerable examples of similar incongruous, incongruous messaging in the creationist literature. For example, I've written about sea otters that are said to be perfectly adapted to sea life because of characteristics made directly by God. And yet, the sea otter is said to be a member of a kind of animal of which all other members are adapted to land. Unfortunately for creationists, defining kinds and handling the unique characteristics of descendant species doesn't get any easier when we move our focus away from mammals. Let's look at an example from insects. Here we're going to talk about a case study of irreducible complexity versus post-creation hyper-evolution. And our example is going to be from the bombardier beetle. Enter the bombardier beetle, poster child for intelligent design and favorite cool bug example of speakers at creation conferences everywhere. Bombardier beetles have a nifty little defense system. When they are threatened, they can mix chemicals stored in an elaborate set of tubes and reservoirs in their abdomen to create a chemical reaction that results in a jet of boiling hot acid being ejected from their posterior toward their attacker. It's quite a feat of chemical and structural engineering. For the recent age creationist, there can only be one answer to the origin of the bombardier beetle. God did it, as we said in our introduction. To hear most young earth apologists speak, 
The bombardier beetle is so specialized. It's like a mechanical pocket watch in which each part of the mechanism is absolutely necessary and must be fully formed for the watch to, to function. It seems an obvious question, but how could such an elaborate system have evolved by chance mutations and natural selection? The creationist literature is replete with such observations and questions about not just the bombardier beetle, but many other organisms. For example, here's a quote from Jerry Bergman on bombardier beetles. The entire structure involving hundreds of parts required to produce, aim, and fire its poisonous mixture of unstable chemicals would be totally useless until the entire structure was completed and perfected. Many different species of bombardier beetle exist, all of which are fully functional and none of which can be used to support a Darwinian scenario. Aside from skunks, which eject a strong smelling substance at will, no other animal has a structure even remotely similar to the bombardier beetle. If the structure had evolved through small modifications, surely many other mammals would exist that likewise have evolved similar but less or more complex structures. Yet this is not the case. The bombardier beetle, although it is only one of millions of unique animals, is completely unique in this one way. Similarly, Melissa Webb at Answers in Genesis has written, There is nothing like it in nature. And any sensible person knows that a tiny beetle less than an inch in size could never produce a controlled explosion by accident. It shouts an intelligent creator. So there you have it. The bombardier beetle is completely unique, and there's nothing like it. And no other animal has a structure even remotely like the bombardier beetle. I agree, it shouts an intelligent creator, as do all living things. However, do bombardier beetles necessarily shout out that the creator worked instantaneously to create these beetles without any inter intermediate process, or what theologians would call secondary causes? Furthermore, just how many individuals have this ability? And is it true that no other animal has a similar structure? Well, the answer for creationists is partly dependent on how they define the limits of a kind, which is our question here. So, the rest of the story. Are bombardier beetles their own kind? Note that above, Bergman acknowledges that many different species of bombardier beetle exist. Previously, having heard many young earth speakers talk about the bombardier beetle, I inferred from them that it was either a single species, or most probably a group of very similar species all having the specialized property of spraying hot benzoquinones as a defensive mechanism. So I was surprised to learn that the term bombardier beetle is given to more than 500 species of beetles found in multiple genera and at least two subfamilies of a larger group, the ground beetles from the family Brachinae. The bombardier beetle represents a diverse group then of beetle species that are not even possibly closely related to one another. This was quite a shocking revelation. Looking closer at the young earth literature, we do find some authors who speak of the diversity of these beetles. For example, Melissa Webb's article provided a helpful graphic in which the bombardier beetles are shown divided into two varieties, the most studied exploding type and those from another group of ground beetles, which are sprayers, foamers, and misters. So now we learn that there are multiple types of bombardier beetles. Likewise, Mark Armitage, reviewed the ultrastructure of the gland responsible for quinone production in one species and compared it to another bombardier beetle species in another genera and acknowledges there's a great variety in the structures of the glands which produce the benzoquinone among bombardier beetles, but more on this later. Why does it matter that there are over 500 species called bombardier beetles? Let's go back to our original question. What is a kind? It is very clear from the young earth literature and public talks that the bombardier beetle is understood to be a uniquely created kind of organism. They claim it couldn't have evolved from an organism that didn't also possess the same irreducibly complex characteristics. So just what is the bombardier beetle kind and what functions and features does it include? Beetle experts have identified, as we said before, 500 species of beetles that are given the common name, the common name bombardier beetle. This name is not a formal taxonomic designation like family, genus, or species. Rather, it groups all beetles based on a single distinctive character. 
their particular defensive behavior that includes the ejection of a nauseous chemical spray via an ex exothermic chemical reaction. The 500 species are not all placed in the same formal taxonomic group, but rather are found in four different subfamilies called tribes, the Brachidini, the Pastini, the, uh, the Ozeanini, and the Metrini. Of the ground beetle family, Carabidini, I can never say these uh, Latin terms, which contains more than 36,000 species. Could this larger family be a created kind itself? If this is so, the species that possess bombardier beetle capabilities are but a small subset of this group and suggest that this specialized defensive capability evolved from ancestors that didn't possess this specific defensive system. So here we're seeing some of the variety of bombardier beetles uh, in different genera. Uh, and different families uh, of organisms. So you see there's some color variation. There's obvious morphological differences between these. They also live in different environments. And as we're going to see, uh, they live uh, in community with different organisms. And therefore, they need different forms of defensive mechanisms uh, in order to survive in those different communities. So how should we define the bombardier beetle kind? So here's four options for the young earth creationists in terms of like, okay, here's, here's the thing that God made. And of all, the organ of all the beetles we see today, which ones are the same kind and which ones are different kinds? So one option is to simply throw all beetles together into one very large kind. Uh, the beetles are over 400,000 different species. Another option Option number two would be to say that just the beetles in the family Caribidae, all right, which is considered a subset of the beetles in total, uh, those would be the ground beetles. There's 36,000 species. Maybe they're a single kind. Or you could be a little more exclusive. You could say that only beetles with the bombardier beetle characteristic, that characteristic being being able to mix some kind of benzoquinone and excrete it in some way from the body as a defensive mechanism, maybe all of those based just on that single characteristic are put together as a single kind. Or option number four, there are actually multiple beetle kinds that share the bombardier characteristic, but they were created separately. God simply created four, five, 10, 20, 50, 500 different individual separately created bombardier beetles, each with their very unique capabilities. Creationists usually distinguish kinds based on some evidence of hybridization among species. Lacking such evidence due to a dearth of hybridization studies, as is in the case of beetles, they would likely group species based on morphological similarities. In other words, what do they just what do they look like? Do they look similar? Given that ground beetles share so many characteristics, it's understandable that all bombardier beetles are placed within the ground beetle family. The modern creationist inclination is to accept all species grouped at the family level by taxonomist as a kind. So in other words, if we, if we use their uh, typical definition of a kind or level, a taxonomic level of a kind, they would say that kinds are usually associated with families. So canine family, the, uh, the feline family, including all the different kinds of cats. Uh, and so if you were to just go with the that level of family level, you could say, well, maybe all ground beetles are one kind. If they followed this practice for insects, they would lump the bombardier beetles into the ground beetle family, despite the specialized bombardier abilities of just some of these ground beetles. Not every one of these ground beetles is able to uh, perform the actions that these particular bombardier beetles can. Hence, the 36,000 species of ground beetles alive today must have derived from a common ancestor God created just 6,000 years ago. But a broader understanding of the limits of kinds has consequences. It involves massive and rapid adaptive evolution within the kind, and it nullifies what has been an effective apologetic tool to creation of speakers. The appeal to irreducible complexity is proof that God created them as they are. So, a ground beetle created kind? This creates more problems than solutions for the young earth creationist. 
If creationists place bombardier beetles in this family, what do they do with the 35,000 other species that don't have the same irreducible and supposedly utter unique features that bombardier beetles have? Let's go back to Jerry Bergman's quote. Many different species of bombardier beetle exist, all of which are fully functional and none of which can be used to support a Darwinian scenario. Aside from skunks, no other animal has a structure even remotely similar to the bombardier beetle. If the structures had evolved through small modifications, surely many other animals would exist likewise that have evolved similar, but less complex structures. Yet this is not the case. The bombardier beetle, although it is only one of millions of unique animals, is completely unique in this one way. If Bergman is correct, then bombardier beetles are unique and had to have been created directly by God. It seems like he would think that other ground beetles must be separately created and thus a different kind. But much of what he says here is just plain wrong. Most importantly, the complex gland that's responsible for producing, storing, and mixing the chemicals that are ejected from bombardier beetles is not, in fact, unique. All members of the Delphagian order of beetles, about 40,000 different species, this includes all ground beetles plus some others in other families or subfamilies, have paired pigodial glands located in the abdomen which are used to produce, store, mix, and excrete chemicals from these beetles. They can either secrete them by oozing, spraying, or something called crepitation, which is explosive spraying or misting. Within the carabid beetles, there are dozens of different forms of acids, ketones, phenols, quinones, the bombardier beetles, that are ejected from these glands for more than just defensive purposes. Do young earth apologists know about members of the ground beetle genus Gallerita? These are called the false bombardier beetles because they have a similar appearance and also spray chemicals at their attacker. However, that spray is formic acid, which is the same substance that ants make, rather than benzoquinones. Are these also irreducibly complex and thus a unique creation and their own kind as well? They are another form of ground beetle, but not ones that are obviously exactly like the bombardier beetles. So all carabid beetles have this chemical production capacity gland, but they deploy somewhat different chemicals and for different purposes. Bergman and other creationists imply, possibly due to ignorance, that the apparatus in bombardier beetles is unique when it is not. Oddly, Armitage and Mullison in 2003, mention Gallerita in their paper about pigodial glands of the bombardier beetles, but they only mention that Gallerita beetles are inhibited by the bombardier beetle spray, not that these false bombardier beetles can spray them back with a different chemical. Yes, the particular chemical concoction they produce in their apparatus is different from, and actually more explosive than, other ground beetles, but the essential components for such a system are all present in Gallerita and thousands of other ground beetles of this family. So there is another specialization among ground beetles that's, as in my mind, as amazing as the bombardier defense. So I've saved the biggest and most interesting revelation to the end. For creationists that insist that bombardier beetles are specially designed, their own logic should lead them to realize that bombardier beetles cannot be a single created kind. There must be at least two created kinds of bombardier beetles, albeit with similar defensive mechanisms. How can I say this? Well, looking at the differences between bombardier beetles, it becomes apparent that beetles in the subfamilies Brachinini and Pasini, and possibly others, cannot be the same kind by most creationist definitions. Young earthers who insist that a kind is defined by the presence of supposedly irreducibly complex characteristics run into a problem. Because the Pasini ground beetles are themselves highly specialized with a completely different set of unique characters. This is because Pasini ground beetles are also ant nest beetles. I, I show this figure because it's up here we're seeing these three different um, subfamilies of ground beetles. Uh, each of which contain a number of different species of bombardier beetles, so-called bombardier beetles, because of their particular capacity. 
Uh, and then it's it's talking about various characters. So these two families both have indented reaction reaction chambers, whereas this other family is not indented. Uh, this one has a filiform microtubular arrangement, whereas these two families have floral ones. So there's combinations of characters that mix and match between the families, um, but there's also sets of differences that are unique to one family or the other, and this is why they're placed in different groups. And I have to note that in two of these families, there are other beetles that share these characteristics, but they don't actually spray the benzoquinone uh, and they produce a different kind of chemical and they have a, a, a slightly different form of defense. And so there's a mixture of these, what many have claimed are irreducibly complex features, but also found in other beetles, but used in different ways. So the ones we're going to talk about now are in the, uh, our, pos our posanoid uh, beetles right here. And um, so they are probably more unique in terms of their mechanism of spraying the benzoquinone, but nonetheless, they have this ejection method of excretion of benzo benzoquinone. Um, it, but they usually do it as, they, some of them, some of the species do it as kind of a froth that covers the back end of their body and makes them unpalatable. And some of them can actually make a jet, meaning they spray it uh, onto as a defensive mechanism. So let's look a little bit further at this particular group of bombardier beetles and see how other ways that they're different. So as I'm saying, one of the really unique features of them is that they're ant nest beetles. And ant nest beetles make their home in ant nests. They're called myrmecophiles. Yes, hundreds of Pacini bombardier beetle species. And yes, there are many different species because different species live in di with different species of ants. Um, live in ant nests where there are parasites on their hosts. How do they live with the ants without the ants attacking them, especially since they're parasites? They excrete chemicals that identify themselves as ants. In addition, they have anatomical structure an anatomical structure that emits sounds that mimic ant queens causing the ants to treat them with great care. I don't think it takes a whole lot of imagination just learning that to realize these are highly specialized characteristics and features which probably should make you ask well how did they come to be that way like how how did they figure out how to pretend to be ants making the actual chemicals that make the ants think them think that they're themselves i have no doubt that if a creationist read about this they would marvel at the amazing complexity of the auditory devices and their ability to manipulate the behavior of the ants and shout god did it they would consider that chemical cues and sound making capacity as irreducibly complex characters that could not have originated via any natural processes or secondary causes. The Pacini bombardier beetles have so many unique characteristics of their own. Applying the logic found in popular creationist literature, we'd expect them to conclude that these beetles are a separate creation. In other words, their own kind. So again, here's the uh, here's a Pacini uh, beetle and this is the pigidial uh, gland they have in it, which is its gross morphology, just meaning the, the basic observation of the basic parts of it are very similar to the other bombardier beetles. But if you get an electron microscope out and you look very, very closely, it's engineered in a slightly different way. They make their chemicals in a little bit different way. Uh, and as I said before, some of them just foam them out of their body and some of them can, can eject them as a jet uh, out of their body. And then over here, we see one of these beetles, which are much larger than the average ant size, more like the queen ant here we see. Uh, and it's just wandering around with these ants. And it is a parasite, meaning it's going to actually consume some of the material from the ant mound, including the ants themselves. And yet the ants uh, seem to be oblivious uh, to this uh, dangerous intruder. So there's the narrow view of kinds, which focuses on unique differences. And then there's the broad view of kinds, which focuses on shared similarities. And this is where this is the, the difficult balance that young earth creationists are, are, are constantly having to deal with. Um, I want to notice these incredible unique features of an organism. But at the same time, I also want to recognize the similarities that they share because it seems intuitive that they are actually related by common ancestry, that God made them as a type of thing versus as unique things. The conundrum for the younger taxonomist is apparent. 
The ecology of living with ants as if they were ants sets the Pacini beetles species apart from other beetles. At the same time, they also share so many features with other ground beetles, including other bombardier beetles, that's tempting to consider all ground beetles as a single kind. To this point, young earth popularizers lump the bombardier beetles together as a single kind. What I am suggesting is, unless they wish to go further and place them into a broader kind, including all gr ground beetles, they should realize they may need to split the bombardier beetles into multiple created kinds. Yes, the Pacini and Braconier bombardier beetles all excrete the same benzoquinone hot chemicals. But digging a little deeper into literature reveals that, although they produce the same benzoquinone chemical, how they make that chemical and how they inject it from their, eject it from their bodies, some spray, some foam, represents some significant differences. Even Armitage, a young earth creationist, recognizes this. Further, the auditory and other ant manipulation characteristics of the ant nest beetles suggest that they deserve to be considered their own created kind as well. So what is a biblical kind of beetle? You may be confused, and I am too. One thing is clear. The boundaries of a kind depend on what characteristic you focus upon. The Creation Museum has elected to focus on similarities of great apes versus their differences. Hence, they put all the great apes together, excluding humans. Will they likewise ignore the unique characteristics of bombardier beetles and embrace the similarities of ground beetles or maybe even all beetles and place them together as a single kind? So this brings up the prospect of what's called post-creation rapid evolution. The very fact that even a few dozen of the 500 species of bombardier beetles possess significant anatomical differences suggests if they truly are all one kind of organism, then dramatic changes have occurred to the defensive systems of these beetles. Hence, they're not irreducibly complex. The implications of this fact are that they must be far more malleable by evolutionary mechanisms than are generally recognized by young earth and intelligent design advocates. Imagine if they were to examine a dozen other parts of the beetle's anatomy, such as the stribulatory, a sound-emitting, organ of the ant nest beetles. What might they conclude about the intrabaromitic, which is within a kind, diversity? How much diversity is possible? And if this kind of diversity is in fact possible, what does it say about the concept of irreducible complexity? What about taking the broader understanding of an insect kind? the direction that young earthers have been moving in recent decades. If they are consistent with the family designation as the most likely boundary of a kind, then they're going to need to lump all the ground beetles together in a single type of created life. In this scenario, all ground beetles are related by common ancestry to one another. If this is true, the specializations such as making benzoquinones or chemicals that mimic ant pheromones or the ability to make sounds that appeal to ants are uniquely derived traits within the ground beetle kind. Rather than being irreducibly complex, they would have to be viewed as being products of rapid evolution of the original created beetle kind. Even if they were to say that that original beetle kind was uh, endowed with tremendous amounts of variation that could become the components of these very complex parts, um, they would still have to argue that those complex parts would come together by some sort of naturalistic mechanisms, which again would deny the irreducible, irreducible complexity argument for them. This rapid speciation results in a diversity of ground beetles, some of which were awed by their incredible uniqueness. As we have seen in this brief review, there is much more diversity of structure, function, and behavioral traits in and among these beetles than young earth apologists either know about or recognize. They must decide if the uniqueness of bombardier beetles, or a particular individual species of bombardier beetles, warrants their claim of having a special place in the unique creation or if they should come to understand the bombardier ability, bombardier capacity as one of the many evolved traits that occur within a kind. So let's put it all together. Bombardier beetles have been a favorite example of possessing a complex trait that could not have evolved and therefore must have been created by God, fully formed, rather than having evolved from a non-bombardier ancestor. Two, there are hundreds of beetles with bombardier abilities. However, they don't all perform the action in the same way, suggesting at least some diversification, or might we call that evolution, of their internal structures and behaviors since their creation. 
Three, bombardier beetles aren't all closely related to each other. Rather, some bombardier beetles, such as the ant nest beetles, are more closely related to other non-bombardier beetles and other subfamilies than they are to other bombardier beetles. In other words, the fancy term for that is they're a poly, uh, sorry, a paraphyletic group. This is why they are placed in disparate fam subfamilies of a much larger one, the ground beetle family. This observation that there are at least two separate lineages of bombardier beetles is devastating to the claim of irreducible complexity, and this issue hasn't been addressed by the young earth creationist literature. Four, all ground beetles have the same organ system referred to in this video, the pigodial gland, that bombardier beetles have. They don't all make benzoquinones, but are capable of making a range of other caustic compounds used for multiple purposes, including defense. Five, the presence of internal structures capable of producing and secreting chemicals from the abdomen is not special to bombardier beetles and appears to be a general property suited for adaptation into more specialized versions from a more general ancestor. Six, if all ground beetles are the same kind, one is at a loss to explain how functions such as benzoquinone foams and queen ant mimicry, thought previously by creationists to be clearly uh, irreducibly complex, went on instead to evolve from common ancestors in just a few thousand years. So what's our conclusion here? The broad definition of kind that is popular among creationists today contradicts 40 years of messages conveyed about bombardier beetles as being unique creations that defy any evolutionary explanation. The push to explain species diversity as the product of rapid diversification and evolution from a created ancestral kind over just a few thousand years undermines young earth creationist apologists who point to specialized characteristics of individual species as incapable of having formed by any evolutionary process. So what are young earth creationists going to do moving forward with bombardier beetles? I suspect that the um, uniqueness of the individual trait of bombardier beetles to be able to excrete this benzoquinone uh, will not be used in the same way that it's been used in the past. Uh, the recognition that there are multiple species and each individual species in itself is highly unique in terms of the exact mechanism of how they do it. Um, each of those different species could be argued as irreducibly complex. But I think it's obvious to young earth creationists that at least some species are related by common ancestry to each other and that natural mechanisms of mutation, uh, rearrangements of their genomes, um, natural selection, genetic drift have resulted in the variations that we see today between different species of bombardier beetles. But as we've just covered, there are highly diverse bombardier beetles that are found that of which they're related to other other beetles, ground beetles that don't share this benzoquinone chemical factory. Um, they make different chemicals. And so that raises the specter of even more change that's possible in the common ancestor being and, and deriving new and different features from that common ancestor. So all of this is a, a confusing set of, of questions about how to identify the uniqueness of organisms and what designates an organism as being truly unique, meaning, meaning separately created uh, from other lineages of organisms. Now, I also want to say that since I uh, wrote about this particular topic, I received a response from a young earth creationist who wrote an article in response to um, what I've just read for you. Uh, and it's on the New Creation um, blog, uh, sponsored by Is Genesis History. And Paul Garner uh, very nicely wrote uh, this article, Bombardier Beetles and Barominology, right? And barominology is, is taxonomy for young earth creationists. And uh, I want to I respond to a, a couple things he says. He has three different uh, responses or observations about my article. Uh, the first one was, yes, we do need to, um, as I said here, we do need actual studies to move beyond speculation. That there are different, he recognizes there are different subfamilies that contain bombardier and non-bombardier forms uh, within a single, potentially a single kind. Uh, and so uh, his answer is, yes, we don't know. We need more work. 
But I'll read the second one here. Second, the observations Duff makes conflict only with a certain type of design argument. And yes, I, I mentioned uh, intelligent design multiple times. One that was admittedly popular with previous generations of creationists. This design argument assumes that the bombardier beetle is directly created by God in essentially its present form, with all the elements of its complex chemical defense system already present. Duff is right to point out that this kind of argument conflicts with the findings of modern baromenology, which suggests that bombardiers and non-bombardiers are variant forms within a single created kind. So here we have Paul Garner taking the position, which I just said was probably going to happen with young earth creationists, which is they're going to place most of the ground beetles, if not all the ground beetles, together in a single created kind. Perhaps that's, perhaps that's a revelation to lay people. I think that is a revelation to the, the, the lay Christian who doesn't know the sort of the academic young earth creationist literature. But it's hardly a new idea to creation biologists who've been talking about this stuff for quite a while. And so my response to this is, I, yes, um, in the Young Earth creationist literature, although they don't speci there's not a lot of discussion about bombardier beetles themselves, but there certainly is similar problems in many, many other different kinds or groups of organisms. Uh, and these same questions arise, how, how much to lump and how much to split? How, how do we identify the, the, the boundaries of a kind? And he's right that in the, I'll, I'll call it the academic creationist literature, there are discussions of this and uh, a, a willingness to accept a great amount of diversification, uh, including diversification of biochemistry and so forth and, and organ systems uh, and adaptations within those organ systems from an originally created kind. Uh, but this is still a mixed message within young earth creationism. And I think Paul Garner recognizes that. I mean, he's saying that, okay, over the, you know, Sure, that this was previous generations, but the previous generations are are still alive today. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, Ken Ham and other speakers at Young Earth Creationist Conference, but especially those outside of the major organizations or the major academic sort of side of Young Earth Creationism, uh, the popularizers of Young Earth Creationism on YouTube and other blogs, they're going to point to the bombardier beetle over and over and over as the gotcha question, right? Um, and then I comment, well, but you can't explain the bombardier beetle, right? It's so perfectly made, it could, you know, God must have made it. And the inference that they are making is that God made that exact bombardier beetle exactly the way it is. But as Paul Garner is pointing out here, he's essentially admitting that the bombardier beetle as in its exact form today is not the original bombardier beetle. And, and the original kind might have been a ground beetle that just had the general capacity to make various chemicals and, make, and have these glands. But then there was variations that occurred and they adapted and basically evolved. I'm going to use the word evolved here because I think it's appropriate. They evolved um, these different uh, specific features uh, for their specific environments and locations where they live. In Paul Garner's last point, um, he and at the end of his post, he, he says the following. He says, far from being devastating, I find all this all immensely interesting and exciting. Yes, baromenology means we have to rethink some naive assumptions of the past, but it provides us with something much better, a fruitful research program that allows us to propose and test hypotheses about design, diversification, and more, besides in a way that creationists were never able to do before. So that leaves one last question. Who's up for some carabid baromenology? Yes, he's, uh, you know, I, I agree that uh, he's essentially admitting, yes, more work needs to be done. We can't really answer this question, but maybe in a group like this, um, we can tease out some of these, these really difficult questions. And that is the question of how to understand and identify design from original creation versus the appearance of design through processes of natural selection and so forth, or I'll call them God's providential processes that have been acting since the creation and have allowed organisms to adapt to new environments. Um, and all of that would be critical to know for identifying what constitutes a kind uh, versus constitutes separately created organisms. All right, with that, I'm going to leave it there. 
uh, thanks for listening. Uh, my name's Joel Duff, and I would appreciate a, a like and a follow if you found any of this information useful or helpful. I'm sure we'll come back to the concept of what a kind is many, many times. <laughs>